Okay, Ellie Hassenfeld, welcome to EA Global virtually. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Obviously, uh, not the ideal circumstances, but we appreciate you uh, making time to record an AMA. And I think our audience is going to be very interested to hear uh, directly from you. So let's jump right into it. Just before uh, this talk, we saw a video of a, a pre-recorded talk by Buddy Shaw, who I understand recently joined as GiveWell's uh, managing director. And I know he hasn't started yet, but a uh, question about what his work is going to entail, uh, even though he's, his start date is still in the future. And then also a uh, question we're looking for an update on GiveWell's recently announced research agenda. GiveWell announced that it's going to be scaling up research and focusing on uh, some different policy interventions, including public health regulation around things like lead paint and tobacco, uh, as well as potentially helping governments better implement social programs and improve governance uh, generally. So new research agenda, new leadership there. Tell us about it. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Uh, we're super excited about Buddy joining. Buddy is awesome. Um, the, the reason he's coming on board is GiveWell has done a lot and had a huge impact in our first 13 years of existence. And the big question that we're trying to make progress on is how do we increase our impact even more from where we are today to where we want to be in the future? And Buddy brings two things to the table. You know, first, he's just an exceptional person. We've worked really closely together for the last five years while he's been running ID Insight. He founded or co-founded and then ran a successful large research organization. And as GiveWell tries to take its operation to the next level, Buddy is just going to be so helpful in, in getting us there. But uh, more concretely, you know, GiveWell's been an organization that's been relatively internally focused in its like first first 13 years. And, and what I mean by that is a lot of the work we do focuses on reviewing academic papers, uh, talking to charities and then reviewing their monitoring and evaluation. And we think there are a lot of opportunities for GiveWell to increase its impact by broadening our external engagement with the global health and development community. Uh, you know, we're already fairly looped in, but Buddy's primarily going to be focused on building those relationships and looking for opportunities. And I think those opportunities could come in a lot of forms. It could come from us learning from others about what they're doing in ways that help us recommend funding more effectively. Uh, but it also might give us the opportunity to find ways that we could use the research that we do to support or even help improve the giving that some of the largest institutional funders, including governments, do worldwide. And so when Buddy comes on, we think he's going to help by starting to explore some of those opportunities and hopefully be one of those new areas that we invest in to try and increase the, the overall value for money of the funds that we're able to direct. Um, so that's one area. Another area is, is what you just mentioned, the questioner asked about um, some of the new areas we're looking at. And again, you know, this, this just comes back to GiveWell's evolution through our history. When, when we got started, uh, Holden and Karnowski, who's my co-founder and I, I mean, we didn't know anything about charity. We didn't know anything about international development. And so we focused where data was most easily available in uh, programs that are relatively short term, relatively quantifiable. Um, and those programs and our top charities have huge impact, but the question is whether by relaxing some of those restrictions, if we can find opportunities that are even higher impact. Um, and we think one of the areas where we might be able to find more cost effective or higher value for money activities is in public health regulation. So essentially trying to support the passage of laws that improve public, public health. And these could be opportunities um, like lead regulation. We regulate lead paint heavily in High income countries, often those regulations are not on the books in low income countries. The same is true for tobacco use. And actually, one of the areas that I think we're most likely to be involved in, it's, it's sort of at the top of our list right now, is alcohol policy. Uh, alcohol, policy alcohol has a massive burden of disease globally, but philanthropic, philanthropically, at least, it's very neglected. There's very few funders that are focused on it as a priority at all. And so the combination of a big public health burden and its relative neglect gives us some you know, instinct that it's a promising place to be looking. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. And it sort of leads into the next question. There's been a lot of debate in the EA community recently, and I probably I, I would say in the broader sphere of development economics as a whole, about the impact of RCT-based uh, approaches to trying to figure out what works and, and what doesn't. Uh, and the RCT approach does tend to focus on relatively small-scale improvements to individual health uh, and income, because obviously you can have, and you must have to do an RCT, a control group and a, and a treatment group. Uh, but some are arguing, I think more and more, that there's kind of a absence of focus and maybe need to, to increase focus on things that you might call kind of big structural change, which I think people typically, uh, when they say that, they're thinking about just broader economic development within a country, right? Like why are some countries rich and, and others are not? Um, you are kind of identifying a little bit of a, a middle area there, which is like not necessarily huge uh, structural change, but kind of, uh, you know, more pointed uh, reforms that a country might be able to implement. How are you guys thinking about that debate? I'm sure you're aware of it. Um, is this something where you're, you're like deliberately trying to kind of move up the scale, uh, so to speak? Um, and how do you feel about the, the difficulties inherent in attempting to quantify that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really great question. It's something that, that we do think about a lot. I mean, first off, I guess I want to question the, the premise of the question a little bit, because I think sometimes the give well top charities can get pigeonholed as uh, small scale and, um, you know, focused only on like an individual impact. And, you know, the programs that we support, uh, malaria programs that deliver nets or seasonal malaria chemo prevention, deworming programs that treat hundreds of millions of children for parasitic infections. I mean, these are just massive public health programs that reach hundreds of millions of people globally. And I mean, now we're living in particularly unsettling times, um, but in some ways in high income countries, we're, we're experiencing the, um, the fear of an unchecked infectious disease that we don't have the ability to effectively prevent and treat. And so I think the, um, you know, these massive public health programs uh, probably should do better on um, someone's scale of the potential for their long-term large-scale impact. Uh, you know, that said, I mean, I think the argument that economic growth is ultimately extraordinarily important is one we take very seriously. Uh, you know, Lant Pritchett is someone who is often pointed to as the person making this argument very vigorously publicly. He's someone we've talked to uh, a handful of times. We take what he says um, into account. And, you know, this area of, of, of the question of, you know, are there opportunities for us to give and accelerate economic growth is something that we, we really intend to get to at some point in the future. We feel like it's on GiveWell's agenda. And um, we've started with public health regulation largely for the reason you said, which is, we think it's an easier way for us to move into the less measurable and more policy driven parts of philanthropic giving. We, we think it's you know ultimately the right place for GiveWell to start and, and hopefully not the right place for us to end. Cool. Well, that that again, I think, uh, anticipates the next question pretty well. This this might still be somewhat in your future. And I know you guys at GiveWell are very careful about uh, going on the record with positions if you're not very confident. So feel free to pass on this if you would like to. But we got a question around uh, an interesting topic in development economics uh, around the hypothesis that potentially we should think about things that developed nations actually did on their path to development as being somehow more proven and therefore things that we should try to promote in developing countries. So for example, you know, reducing trade barriers might be seen to be more promising than uh, investing in microcredit because today's, today's rich countries typically were uh, more pro-trade right in their history than, than others at the time. Uh, and they didn't seem to really have like microcredit institutions. So that's obviously just one example. Uh, but how much uh, credibility, if you have an opinion on this at all, would you give to the argument that things that the rich countries actually did in history are things that the developing countries today should be trying to emulate? Yeah, I mean, we, we put a lot of weight on, you know, what's worked historically at GiveWell. So the argument like really resonates with, with, with me personally, but also with 
our our approach to what we do. I mean, everything we do is is focused on what's the the track record of this intervention, what's the track record of a particular charity. Um, you know, even when GiveWell broadened out and began the work that ultimately became Open Philanthropy, a big part of that work was the history of philanthropy project, where we were trying to understand what had worked historically. So just to set the grounding, I mean, the basic argument here is one that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I don't know enough about what has worked historically to comment thoughtfully on that. Um, but I do know that, you know, even in the United States in the early 20th century, uh, malaria was common, um, hookworm was common. And two, you know, early programs that existed in the 20th century in the United States were programs to eliminate malaria and um, a hookworm eradication campaign led by the Rockefeller Foundation that um, you know, I think, and, and I think those those programs happen for good reason. That uh, a sick population is unable to do a, a lot of things that you need to have a functioning economy. Um, but you know, all, all that said, I mean, I think I think this is an interesting an interesting question that um, I you know I'd like us to take seriously as we think about you know what's likely to work best, especially as GiveWell you know, goes through this process of, of expanding the focus of our work from um, the, the types of interventions that are more easily measurable on a multi-year timeframe, you know, to the types of programs where it's so difficult to get feedback in the near term that, you know, you really have to lean heavily on, you know, the best case you can make based on what's worked historically. Cool, thank you. I should also uh, give credit where it's due on these questions. They are coming from the AMA post that was posted in the EA forum. Uh, so I don't want to make it seem as if I'm uh, coming up with all of them. They, they were sourced from the community, and these are what we thought to be the, the best of the bunch. Uh, the next one focuses on the topic of gender inequality. Uh, obviously, it's a big area of focus for a lot of development organizations. It seems, uh, at least to this questioner, I, I guess I, I don't necessarily... Uh, know enough, uh, but I'll, I'll attribute to the questioner that GiveWell hasn't really done much in the space of gender equality, uh, reproductive health, or other related issues over time. So is that something that GiveWell has thought uh, much about? Is that something that GiveWell would go as far as to potentially consider an intrinsic good beyond its sort of you know contribution or correlation to general development? Um, and what are your you know kind of broadest thoughts on uh, the topic of women's empowerment? Yeah. So the way that, you know, the way that GiveWell has, has set up our work is, you know, we focused, um, I, I should say we're, we're broadly uh, consequentialist in the giving that we do. And we're focused on, you know, the impact that the, the direct impact that that has on the world. And so we take that, you know, sort of a, a utilitarian perspective rather than a perspective that's trying to, um, that, that takes the philosophical value of, I don't know, of justice or of helping the, the least well off. Um, and so that's always been the frame that we've taken. And so causes that focus on um, equality per se are not ones that we've prioritized historically for, for that reason. Um, the, the way in which, uh, to, to your question, that we you know, could potentially treat that differently is you know, via treating gender equality as an intrinsic value. Um, I, I should say like it it could itself be an, an instrumental value that leads somewhere else, and that would fit neatly within our framework. Um, but it's not something that we've, um, I, I should, you know, directly looked into before. Um, but then within the broader framework of whether or not we would treat that as an intrinsic value, we certainly could. Um, you know, we've, it, it's been a major challenge for us to think about how to do, um, you know, how to weigh different good outcomes that charities achieve. Um, you know, some charities improve health or save lives, other charities improve incomes, other charities improve subjective well-being. Uh, and when we've looked at how other policymakers and funders have dealt with these issues, we haven't been satisfied with their approaches. And so we've tried to address this challenge directly via uh, what we've called moral weights, where we try to explicitly compare the good achieved via two different charitable outcomes. So we want to say, you know, this is how much, this is how we value an, income, an, an, an amount of income increased by a charity against a life-saving charity. You know, these, these are things where, you know, we don't have the right answers. I mean, I, there aren't any right answers. And our approach to trying to address these questions have evolved over time. 
um, from, you know, at first just taking uh, the median of what staff or give well staff say, which I mean is obviously problematic, but was the best that we felt like we could do uh, to last year funding a survey that ID Insight carried out to uh, hear from beneficiaries about what they valued. Um, and, you know, this approach is, is still evolving um, internally where, you know, now we've designated a group of people on our team to really focus on these questions, both to figure out and, and assign weights for various outcomes, but also to decide which outcomes deserve to have intrinsic weight. And so we would essentially put this question to that group and have them spend some time thinking about it, uh, sharing that with the team and then sharing that with the general public. And so it's certainly something that, you know, could happen down the line. Uh, on reproductive health specifically, uh, that is an area that we've looked into uh, and we just haven't yet found interventions that, you know, we see as competitive with our top charities on, a, on an impact basis. And so that's the reason that, you know, we haven't recommended funding there, but, um, you know, that's certainly within the scope of, of things that we would consider and, you know, are even like currently looking into as, as we, you know, in, in 2020 are searching for new promising organizations. Thank you. So next question, uh, you're the chair of the Global Health and Development Fund, which is uh, unusual, unusual among the EA funds in that it almost always gives out larger grants, typically $500,000 or more. Uh, the, the other EA funds tend to give out smaller grants, normally in the range of ten uh, dollars to $50,000 each. So tell us about your rationale for focusing on larger grants with that fund. Yeah, so I think there's a few reasons that's happening. Um, you know, the first and most obvious one is that the, the, the work that we're doing to find opportunities for that fund are coming out of the research work that GiveWell is already doing. Um, we don't have a separate research stream looking for, for, for opportunities for the fund specifically. And GiveWell's research team is primarily focused on opportunities that serve GiveWell's needs. And you know those needs are finding really cost-effective places to put very large amounts of money. And so you know we tend to just be focused on the opportunities that are really big. Um, you know, I think, I think that that rationale is good, partially because, you know, what our top charities do is, is really exceptional and very cost effective. Um, you know, I think that their ability to deliver programs at scale creates very cost effective opportunities that are hard to find elsewhere. And I think even as we have explored smaller giving opportunities, you know, we've often been, shouldn't say we've been surprised, but we found it very difficult to identify opportunities that we really believe all in over time will end up being more cost effective than, you know, our, our most cost effective top charities. Uh, you know, I, I do think that like, you know, potentially there's an opportunity for, um, you know, someone who's like really looking for these small things to be good at and find those opportunities. Um, you know, there are, other funders that in the global health and development space that are looking for those opportunities and directing funding to them. So groups like Ashoka and Endeavor and, and Skoll. And so I think there are, the, the global health and development funding infrastructure is also more developed than the funding infrastructure in uh, the some of the other causes that are most salient to members of the effective altruism community. Um, and so I also suspect that there's um, less of a need for that funding in global health and development than there might be elsewhere. Um, though I'm not confident in that. And, and I certainly could believe that, you know, it's, it's very possible that someone could identify, you know, really great small giving opportunities that, that we're missing because we're just not prioritizing looking for them. Do you know off the top of your head, the rate at which a new charity is competitive with your top charities? Obviously, you guys have a, a certain selection bias even in examining things, but of the things that you would even, uh, you know, find it worthwhile to look into, how often does one kind of threaten, if not, you know, fully crack into that top echelon? Part of the year, um, so I might get these numbers a little bit off, but I mean, we started the year with a, a list of, you know, uh, 50 or so opportunities that we thought 
would be you know, potentially competitive with our top charities. And in that group of 50, I don't mean something that would just sort of clear the bar to be on the list, but I mean something that, you know, really could compete for the last dollar that we would allocate or we would recommend this year. You know, GiveWell, in many ways, we now think of ourselves as a group that's responsible for allocating $100 million plus of funding to opportunities in global health and development. And so our primary focus every year is trying to improve the quality of that allocation, which means find things that are that that make the last dollar we give more cost effective than it otherwise would be. And I'd say like right now we're we're three months um, about into the year, um, and maybe there's like a handful of things that um, have the potential to be better than the Against Malaria Foundation and Malaria Consortium Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention Program. Um, some of Deworm the World deworming programs that are very cost effective, some of Helen Keller International's vitamin A supplementation programs. Um, but those programs are just so exceptionally cost effective and collectively have so much room for more funding that it's extremely rare. Um, and so, you know, I think in the, it, it, the, the rate is just extremely low, primarily because, you know, we're not interested in diversifying for the sake of it, you know, we're interested in in trying to find the the things to give to that maximize well-being to the greatest extent. And you know, the current opportunities that we have are the best we've been able to find in the last thirteen years, and those are just incredibly good at what they do. So that actually uh, connects to another question that I had queued up for a little bit later, but I, I want to kind of zoom to it now. Um, how do you guys go about your research? Process. I mean, it's, it's striking to me that you said there we're you know, only two and a half months into the year, and it sounds like you've already whittled the list down quite a lot. So when you guys, and I know you're extremely thorough in, in what you publish, so how do you know when to stop and how do you know when to keep going? Uh, you know, what was the kind of threshold for determining that it sounds like as many as like 90% of the 50 that you entered the year with have already been kind of filtered out. If I have that right, what does that decision-making process uh, look like? And is it really then going to be the case that the, the next nine plus months is going to be focused solely on those last five things and, and trying to qualify them uh, fully for the list? Is that, is that how it works? Yeah, so you asked a, a bunch of questions. I'll, I'll try to answer a couple of them and then feel free to come back with others if, if I'm not fully addressing what, what's on your mind. Um, you know, primarily what we're doing is, you know, at every, at every moment we see our scarcest resource as our research time. And so we, we only want to spend research time investigating an opportunity when we think we get a good return on that time. And, you know, we think of return on that time as a function of the likelihood that it changes some future funding decision that we make. And so we might look into something, we might look into something very briefly and then figure out that uh, it's extremely unlikely that all in, it'll end up being a very cost-effective giving opportunity. Um, you know, the underlying analysis for that decision will be shared among the team that's working on it. Um, it will then eventually be shared with the wider team. Um, but, you know, the, the idea there is to uh, maximally interrogate, you know, those ideas to see how well they're holding up under scrutiny before we drop something. And, you know, when we drop something, we're not uh, dropping it forever. We're essentially deprioritizing it because we think at the moment there's something else that, you know, is potentially even more cost effective that, you know, could affect our funding to an even greater extent down the line. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's how we think about it. Um, you know, the next nine months is not just about trying to, to qualify an opportunity for the list. You know, for a long time, GiveWell was very focused on the top charities list as the only thing we were producing. I mean, it was essentially synonymous with GiveWell. And, you know, now GiveWell makes a lot of funding recommendations to open philanthropy, to the Global Health and Development Fund, and sometimes even to other donors that we call incubation grants. And so there's a lot of work that we're doing on, on that front that's um, happening on an ongoing basis that's not just accruing towards the end of the year. Um, and so I hope a lot of the work we'll be doing as we go through the year is a combination of seeing whether things should be on the list, um, looking for other opportunities to make grants that are not accruing to the list itself, and then um, you know continuing to build the pipeline up for the future um, sort of across all of the different research domains that we're focused on. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating 
uh, approach, and I really like your framework for the return on your research time and, and even just the, the notion that that's your scarcest resource, I think is a good insight into yourself. Another question just kind of related to uh, give well as a whole, and this uh, questioner starts by just, first of all, complimenting you and noting that GiveWell seems to be a very well-run organization. Uh, you're noted, obviously, for your transparency, uh, your prolific output of research, and, and just clear communication uh, that always indicates like what's up to date, what your level of confidence is in, in the uh, positions that you're taking, so on and so forth. So great job on all of that stuff. Uh, what kind of tips on organization, management, and research strategy would you uh, share with the rest of the community that aspires maybe to be a little bit more like GiveWell in their operation? Yeah, so first of all, I mean, that's very kind. I really appreciate uh, um, that someone would say that. Um, it's also nice to hear because it's not how I feel day to day about GiveWell. I feel um, you know mostly focused on all the things that we're doing wrong, that we need to do better. Um, you know, it feels like we've made huge strides even in the last couple of years to fix things that, uh, gosh, are hard to believe they were broken for so long. But it's, um, so it's, it's nice to hear from the outside that someone has that impression of us. It's certainly something we're, we're striving for to, to run an effective organization. Um, I, I, think, I think some of the things we've, we've done, or at least we've tried to do well, I'm, I'm not sure we have, we've you know, put a very heavy priority on uh, building really great relationships between managers and direct reports. And, and I think those relationships have helped us, um, you know, especially recently retain staff, uh, get really great feedback about things that aren't working um, and build a very cohesive organization where, I mean, I think frankly, we're able to have internal transparency in a way that would be difficult in a place where people didn't feel as comfortable with each other. Um, you know, we, we've also just been very focused, uh, you know, especially recently on very, being incredibly judicious about the roles we hire for and the people we put in those roles. Um, you know, I think that we sometimes wonder whether our recruitment process is, you know, too stringent, it, it's too long, uh, you know, whether we're losing people that we wouldn't otherwise, though, you know, mostly we see people applying and going through the process. Um, but what that means is that often after the recruitment process, we're in a position to really, we feel pretty good about our ability to forecast what someone will be able to do on the job. Uh, and that has helped us make really good decisions about whom to hire. Um, this is something we've put a lot of energy into over the last three or four years. It's something we do a lot better now than we used to. Um, and, and just when I think about what makes GiveWell great today and what is going to make GiveWell succeed in the future, um, it's just this team of, you know, exceptional people, exceptionally talented, exceptionally committed, exceptionally, you know, good on, on sort of their core values and commitment to what GiveWell's trying to do that's, that's going to make us succeed. Um, yeah. And so, so I think, you know, ultimately, I, I think it's those things. I mean, it, it ultimately, the organization is just the people, right? And so, um, you know, building good relationships with the people and being really thoughtful about which roles you hire for and how you select those people. Um, you know, has been really important to us. It's the thing we obsess over all the time. And, and it's probably the, the, the number one thing that, that I'd advise others to do. Yeah, so on that note, uh, I was going to actually end with this question, but now seems like a good time to ask, what are the roles that you guys are looking to hire for today? I'm sure many people uh, here uh, watching will be interested to learn about that from you. And are there any particular backgrounds or areas of expertise that you are uh, specifically looking for right now? Yeah, so there's two, there's two big areas. I mean, I'd say our number one priority, you know, is uh, senior research capacity. And, and what I mean by that are researchers who can really help drive GiveWell's future research agenda. You know, uh, half an hour ago at the beginning of the call, we started talking about new areas that GiveWell wants to look into, questions we haven't looked into. Um, and the biggest reason we're not moving as quickly on that as we'd like is that, you know, we just don't have the research capacity that we want. Um, now, what, what we think we need in those researchers is we need people who um, <clears throat> combine, uh, you know, familiarity with quantitative empirical research methods uh, with a focus on getting things done in the real world. You know, we've had a lot of struggles because sometimes we meet people 
who are just like incredibly smart and they're great economists, but you know, they just want to go all the way to the end to like answer a really complicated technical problem. And, and then other times we meet the, um, I don't know, the more, let's call them management consultant mindset person who's really practical, uh, but doesn't want to get into some of the weird questions that we need to deal with. And so we're really looking for the people who can marry those two qualities uh, and can bring both the technical and quantitative, but then also the real world application. Um, you know, and back to something that we were talking about earlier, you know, we, we really focus on this return on our time invested. And so we need people who both know when to go deep uh, and can keep going deep when necessary, but also know when they've gone far enough. Um, you know, I see, I see these research hires as just like the number one priority for GiveWell right now. If, if we can hire a great additional group of researchers to work with the team we have, uh, I have no doubt that like GiveWell will continue to succeed in its research work into the future. Um, and we really need to do that because without it, we just won't be able to make the progress that we hope to. Um, the, the other big area of focus for GiveWell is outreach. So for a long time, GiveWell, you know, primarily focused on research. We didn't invest a lot of resource in trying to raise money for our recommended charities. And we were just incredibly fortunate that people found us, they talked about us, donors came to us. And you know, we were mostly, mostly reactive in, in our outreach. And now we're trying to focus on building out more of that team to raise more money for the groups we recommend. And so we're also um, now hiring for folks uh, for, for a position called a, a gift officer. So that's someone who works with major donors to help them understand GiveWell's work and, and its research with the goal over the long run to help that relationship build into them giving more, uh, you know, more money to our recommendations because they feel better and more confident about where we've, we've given. Um, and there, you know, we think that job is, you know, open and exciting for someone who really likes explaining things to people, building relationships, um, and, you know, some development or sales experience, I think is really helpful, um, but it's not absolutely necessary. You know, some of the people we have on staff um, you know, have essentially learned on the job and, and that works well in that position. What does the portfolio look like for an individual in that role? Like, is it 10 people that they work with or, you know, how, how kind of close are those relationships? Yeah, so it varies based on the, um, the, the size of the donor, but, um, you know, I'd say broadly, it's about 100 people that uh, a gift officer would have in their portfolio. Um, they're people that they, you know, at probably have met at least once, but probably don't meet in person every single year. Um, and then try to, you know, stay in touch over time to ensure that, you know, both the donor understands what we're working on and we understand, you know, what parts of our work the donor is most interested in. Um, because, you know, people are interested in all different aspects of their work. There's different types of information that they find most useful and knowing enough about them to know what to share can really help us um, you know, give them the type of information that that's most helpful to them in, in, in settling on their giving decisions. Yeah, that's a really fascinating approach. How many people do you have in that role today? Two people full time in that role. Um, and we think that over time, like we could easily grow that function out to like five people um, in the next couple of years if we grow in the way that we want. Um, you know, currently that position is uh, just severely understaffed relative to the number of donors we have in our community. Yeah, yeah no, no doubt. doubt. I, I would, would imagine, imagine you could go, go well beyond uh, five over time as well. Um, that reminds me of another uh, thing that I was thinking about um, in anticipating this conversation, and that is GiveWell's advertising. So I, I hear uh, spots read by Ezra Klein on, on his podcast and, and other podcasts uh, from time to time as well. Is that an activity that, uh, I mean, first of all, for all I know, the time may be donated uh, to you guys, because I know Ezra Klein is, uh, identifies as an effective altruist and was actually going to speak at, at EA Global about his book um, until, obviously, things kind of went in another direction. But if that is space that you're actually paying for, how do you think about the ROI on uh, advertising? But I don't know if it is or isn't. Yeah. So, you know, we're paying for that space. And one of the things that we're focused on this year is scaling up 
our uh, paid marketing operation, or at least I should say we, we were planning to focus on. I mean, I think with everything that's happening right now, we're just gonna step back and reassess what makes the most sense. And, you know, I hope that, and, and I expect we're still gonna move forward to some extent with that, but, you know, things, the world has changed a lot in the last month. And, and so we're thinking about what we wanna do, what we wanna do there. Um, but we, we paid for those spots and, you know, we measure the ROI based on, you know, just looking at the dollars that we put in and then the dollars that we're able to track as going to our recommended charities as a result of that advertising um, in 2019. So last year, um, you know, we just saw an exceptional ROI from those advertising spots on podcasts. Um, so we, we spent about $150,000 total um, and we saw about, about $500,000 in total donations to recommended charities uh, that we were able to track as a direct result of those ads. You know, we know that over time, um, you know, most dollars that come in in year one continue into the future, you know, year two, three, four, five. And so, you know, even that is an understatement of the return on investment that we like ultimately expect to get. Um, now, we the thing that we know is we have to be careful about, you know, where we advertise. So, you know, we we saw with the Ezra Klein show in 2019 that we got uh, just an excellent return on investment. There've also been podcasts where, you know, we spent a lot and haven't got that same return. And, and so the big question for us is, you know, trying to figure out like where it makes sense to test and then when, where it makes sense to scale. Um, because our goal is just to, you know, maximize the dollars that go to our recommendations. And, you know, if we see opportunities to take $100,000 and it could either go to a top charity or we could use it to drive, you know, half a million dollars immediately to that top charity. I mean, it's pretty obvious that, you know, we want to be advertising to drive more money to the recommendations. Yeah, cool. That's interesting. Do you have a theory on, yeah, obviously you're, you know, only able to track so much, especially when you're doing kind of a, a pseudo broadcast uh, medium like a podcast. Do you have a sense for what percentage uh, or a theory of what, what percentage is trackable versus what is kind of the dark matter that's untrackable? We, we really don't know. Um, I mean, that's a really tough question. Uh, yeah, no, we, nobody in marketing does, but I thought you might at least have a theory. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, we, we, we wrote a blog post a couple of years ago where, I mean, I made some absolutely crazy estimates about what it might be by crazy. I mean, entirely unfounded, um, but we really don't know. You know, we, we, we asked some donors to put up matching funding for our podcast advertising last year, both because it creates an incentive for people to give and also because it would make it easier to track because we said, if you want to get the match, you have to give via a specific URL. And so we think yeah, that helped smart. us. Um, but there's no question that, you know, we see that ROI, you know, the, the you know, roughly 150K in, uh, or 150K spend, 500K in donations as the floor, because, you know, both there's the lifetime value of the donor, which is going to, you know, the, on average, the dollars are going to keep coming in. And then also, we, we've also just seen consistently in GiveWell's history that a large portion of the money we move comes from very large donors who hear about us in mass media, spend a long time doing research, and then we ultimately hear about them a few years down the line. And so we expect that, you know, there's even donations that will end up coming through from someone who heard about us on the Ezra Klein show or you know, on podcasts in general that we haven't even heard about yet, but just based on uh, how, based on the pathway that we've seen so many very large donors take in the past, we think that ultimate return will be, you know, will be even greater. And so what we're trying to do is find those opportunities. Like right now, it's a no brainer to keep advertising if we can do it in the right places and to scale up advertising to the appropriate level. And we just have to figure out the right way to go in the right places and at the right level so that, you know, we don't underspend or overspend, which is obviously going to be a challenging call for the marketing team to make. Yeah. Cool. Very interesting. Uh, well, not too much time remaining, but I want to ask one uh, timely question, which again, you can potentially pass on if you don't have an opinion. Uh, and then we'll do a kind of a couple of classic uh, EA questions as well. So uh, the timely one uh, obviously, you know, we're doing this remotely because of what is now a, a global pandemic. Do you have any thoughts about effective giving opportunities that respond to crises in general and this crisis in particular? Um, and, you know, is there anything that you think could be, uh, you know, on the level of your top charities potentially? 
Yeah, we're not we're not sure yet. Um, it's a good question. It's it's a question that we all are asking internally, and we we are looking into opportunities to respond directly, especially in in low income countries. Um, you know, it seems as if in high income countries, this is the highest priority of government. A lot of money is going to try and address it. Um, we suspect that you know we don't have value added in directing funding there, um, but you know I've also heard from a lot of people in low-income countries, both the charities we recommend and also people who run health facilities, how frightened they are of what might happen in a, a context like Sub-Saharan Africa, where the health infrastructure, you know, we, we've talked a lot in you know recent days about how poor the health infrastructure is or how relatively poor it is. Um, in 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 the in high income countries, places like the U.S., the Bay Area where I live, um, but it's it's you know going to be an even bigger problem in sub-Saharan Africa because the infrastructure is so much worse. Um, and so we're trying to look into um, you know what responses could be both for the and that that could be at the you know the charity specific level where they're looped into health systems and health workers, um, but potentially also you know more broadly. Um, it's just something that you know we don't know the answer to yet because it's just too early to say. Yeah. Do you feel pressure to do something? I mean, you guys are obviously very rigorous in your approach, uh, but is there sort of a sense that like we can't sit this one out uh, or would you be comfortable just saying, you know, hey, we spent some time. We can't find anything. We're just going to hold the line on the on the top charity. You know, we're almost we're always driven by trying to find the opportunities that have highest impact and you know, we, we have sat out a lot of disasters in the past, even when people are, are asking questions about where to give. And it's because, you know, frankly, we just don't think we have a good answer for them that will really help them beyond, you know, very high level tips. So we have a, a blog post, uh, I think it's called like SIP, Six Tips for Disaster Giving, um, you know, which we, we uh, kind of share in disasters. But you know, we, we think that's about the best you can do, or at least the best we've been able to do. And so we do sit it out. Um, and so here, you know, if what we end up concluding is that, uh, you know, sort of boring everyday malaria control is a better use of donor funding than addressing COVID, um, you know, that's something that we're going to say. That's something that we're going to do. Um, and I think it's really... Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a position that Givel's in that, that, you know, we all feel very fortunate about, that we have a donor community that... I think ultimately really supports the core values that our organization is about. And so they want to see us, you know, ultimately they want to see us trying to direct money where we think it will improve people's lives the most, you know, rather than responding to the, the cause of the day. Um, and so we're in a position where, you know, we can really hold the line on doing the research that we think is most valuable. And then. Yeah, that's an admirable relationship to have been able to create with your stakeholders for sure. So, okay, a couple uh, classic EA questions. So first, just kind of zooming out, uh, thinking about the movement as a whole. Um, I think, you know, everybody's kind of familiar with the broad trajectory when it started. Uh, you know, it was much more kind of almost not synonymous with GiveWell, but, you know, very much focused on kind of the same core things as GiveWell, big focus on global poverty, health and development uh, issues. In the years uh, more recently, it has broadened out. We've now got a, a kind of broader portfolio of things, a lot of things that are more speculative, a lot of more kind of uh, small grants, as we talked about earlier, to go try new things uh, and try to find those next hits. Um, I guess two questions on that topic. What do you personally think of, of that shift? How do you feel like the, the movement is evolving? Um, and how has that affected GiveWell as an organization? The, the effective altruism community focuses on are causes that that are just like so important. Um, you know, focus on uh, long term issues that you know humanity's long term future. Focus on animal welfare, um, and then you know building this movement. Th those are all just like e exceptionally valuable. And so um, you know, I'm in, in in my position at GiveWell. Uh, I'm really happy that that those other organizations. Uh, and the, the the groups that work on in those causes all exist because it really enables GiveWell to focus in the area where, you know, I think we can 
do the most given our position and our organizational culture and then our comparative advantage. Um, and so the fact that, you know, the, the fact that there are people, donors and organizations focused on, for example, trying to um, improve farm animal welfare as much as possible really enables me to very like truly say the, the reason GiveWell is not thinking about that today is that there are others doing that work and we don't think we have that much to add. And so it enables us to focus our energy, you know, much more closely. Um, I think overall it's been very beneficial to give well. I mean, the, you know, I remember what things were like in uh, August, 2007, which was like my first day full time at give well. And there was no community. There were no people who were interested in asking the questions that um, the community is asking. There certainly was no, EA Global being held where people were, were going to, I don't know, ask questions about global health and development during a global pandemic. And so, um, you know, I think all of this has just created um, a very like rich and, and fulfilling community, um, which, you know, I'm very proud to be a part of. And, you know, just personally, I find it, uh, it's really nice to be able to, um, you know, have, have my day job at GiveWell and then, you know, go and listen to Toby Ord on the 80,000 Hours podcast talk about, you know, his new book and, and just the, you know, amount of intellectual energy that's going into all of these. Yeah, cool. Um, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with that. So last question, uh, kind of a classic two-parter. Um, first of all, what is something that you think that a, a typical uh, EA Global attendee, if you can imagine uh, that composite person, might be getting wrong uh, either about global health and development uh, in general or in particular about GiveWell's work? Uh, so give you kind of a chance to correct what you think might be a misconception. And then uh, part two, what is something that you have personally changed your mind about uh, recently, whether that's uh, specific to give wells work or otherwise. You know, m maybe one of the things that I, I worry about most with folks in the EA community and global health and development organizations is that people may think that, you know, the fact that staff at those organizations uh, don't speak the EA language indicates that, you know, those folks are not smart, co competent, and thoughtful. And I'd say that, you know, my experience has really been the opposite. So just to say very explicitly that, you know, those folks are often just incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly thoughtful, but they just don't speak in the same way that, you know, the, the folks in the EA community speak about, you know, expected value in priors. And I think that can lead to, to real miscommunications, it, it can lead to an assumption, uh, an erroneous assumption that, you know, those organizations don't know what they're doing. Um, it, you know, can lead people, I, I worry sometimes in the EA community that, that people sometimes think, you know, they need to start things on their own because, you know, no one's doing the work that needs to be done. Um, when in fact, there's a lot of people out there that are, that are doing some of this work, especially in global health and development. Um, they just don't speak the same language. Um, you know, I think it can also lead to problems in, you know, taking organizations time if you're trying to get them to speak in EA language and, you know, they normally speak another way. And, and so I think it's just really important to, you know, be cognizant of uh, the, the, the way that, you know, this other community, the, the global health and development community can, can communicate and, and just try to like meet them where they are and hear them out, because I think that can really help, um, you know, help us, it help all of us in the EA community better understand um, you know, where they're coming from. Um, about, about GiveWell specifically, you know, I think, I think GiveWell is still often seen as the group that is primarily focused only on these short-term randomized interventions. And, and those are the only ones that we'll consider. And it, it's, this is a big part of what GiveWell does. I think it's always gonna be a big part of what GiveWell does. Um, but, you know, GiveWell has already slowly expanded into supporting things that are you know, much harder to quantify. And, and so I just hope that, you know, people, uh, you know, as, as see that in our work, um, you know, that we've really moved into uh, looking for things that I think most EAs would consider uh, sort of higher risk and less empirically grounded than, you know, sort of conventional give well top charity stuff.
And then and you how have about the other... something that you have changed your mind on recently? Got it. Great. All right. I knew that one was coming. Um, so I'm happy. Maybe I'll give a, a quick one uh, about GiveWell, and I can also give a quick like personal one just in case it's, it's helpful. I feel like I changed my mind on an ongoing basis as I learn things. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that I changed my mind most on at GiveWell recently um, was in, in really in thinking about how we should engage with our donor community. Um, so in GiveWell's first few years, you know, especially, uh, yeah, especially in those first few years, when, when folks donated to GiveWell's top charities, um, they were like really, really interested in all the intricacies and all of the details of our research methodology. And that meant that they'd want to get on the phone and argue about whether AMF's approach to monitoring and evaluation was sufficient to be confident in their impact, or if it was insufficient and we made a mistake in recommending them. Like I, I had those sorts of debates constantly with our donors. And um, you know that led us to develop an approach to outreach which was very research focused. It meant that we were, you know, for a long time uh, engaging with our donor community with the expectation that that is what they wanted. And, you know, it wasn't until, uh, you know, last year or, or, you know, recently, I don't remember exactly when, that we, we, we determined that, you know, our donor community had really changed. Um, you know, as GiveWell became, the, the people I talked to in, 2009, 2010, 2011, I mean, they were early adopters and they were folks who were like very individually engaged in the details of what we were doing in a way that's different than a lot of the people who find us now. You know, our donors are great, but many of the donors who give to GiveWell's charities now, you know, are not spending 50 hours every year reading through all of our research to decide where to give. I mean, we still have some donors like that and it's great, but a lot of them, you know, have spent some time kicking the tires they trust GiveWell, they wanna rely on our recommendations and they need a different type of engagement from us than, you know, hey, I'm a researcher and I'm happy to debate with you about the intricacies of our research. And so that's really driven, uh, you know, we, we had developed an outreach focus that, you know, previously had centered more around, uh, like I'd say, research oriented engagement and research oriented conversations. Um, and we shifted that a little bit to try and meet donors more where they are to make sure that you know, we're giving them the information that they want, which sometimes is not, um, you know, the debate about the research methodology. Um, and then personally, yeah, you, you know, built, I, you built yeah. a brand it really is what you've, you've built there. And that, and people, as you said, they can trust it, but it's, it's that, um, that imprimatur that you've established over a decade has, uh, put you in a position now where people don't even feel the need to go into that same level of depth that, that they used to. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the brand is there. I mean, I think we still hear from people that, um, you know, they're they're like the first time they come, they're like looking at the research, they're they're reading a footnote or two. I mean, that's that's like very common, um, but they're often not going further than like the first few hours of research. Um, so maybe our like next iteration is getting to the point where the folks don't even need to go, you know, to the to the footnote because we have the you know support that makes that possible. Um, you know, I think a challenge we need to overcome is it still takes people a lot of time invested to ultimately feel like totally confident giving a lot of money through us. And we want to keep like making that path even easier for potential donors. Awesome. Well, this has been a fascinating, uh, nearly an hour long conversation at this point. Uh, so we thank you for your leadership in the EA movement. Uh, and we thank you also for your time today joining us for our virtual EA Global uh, thank you again, Ellie Hassenfeld. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, I just want to say thank you to, to you, uh, you know, Nathan and uh, everyone who posted questions on the forum and is watching this right now. I mean, we're living in a very unsettling time. Uh, and I really appreciate that people are staying engaged with this, notwithstanding the, the situation we're going through. So thanks.